Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. And this particular lesson is entitled Covenant Primer. Hmm, that's interesting. This is lesson number two in our series for April 10 of 2021, and as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come once again to gather around this table to talk about your word, to, to learn of you, and to share with those who might have the privilege of listening in all that uh, you want to teach us. May we be as wise as we can. May we follow your guidance in our study together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, in our lesson we talked about last week, we discussed how the whole plan of God came unglued. The loss of the Garden of Eden and the problem of sin arising and so forth. Now we need to remember in all that that sin and the great controversy over the character of God did not start here on this earth. Where did it start? In heaven. In heaven. Read Revelation 12, 7 to 12. So it only spilled over out into this world when Adam and Eve agreed to accept the lies of Satan instead of remaining loyal to God. So in this lesson, we'll review the covenant promises that were made to various individuals down through the Old Testament and compare those with God's promised covenant with us. We will also try to briefly mention how things were going in heaven during those times in the Old Testament. So before we talk about all of that, what, what is a covenant, Jim? The Hebrew word translated as covenant, appearing about 287 times in the Old Testament, is berith. It can also be translated as testament, or last will. Its origin is unclear, but it has come to mean that which bound two parties together. It was used, however, for many different types of bond, both between man and man and between man and God. It was a common use. It has a common use. It has a common use where both parties were men and distinctly religious use where the covenant was between God and man. Religious use has really a metaphor based on common use, but, the, but with a deeper connotation that is a meaning, the International Standard Bible Co Encyclopedia. Okay. Okay, you can read all about where it's come from and so forth, and that's quoted in our Bible study guide. There are three main elements in a covenant, or in the covenant, that God wants to make with us. One, God affirmed the covenant promises with an oath, Galatians 3.16 and Hebrews 6.13 and 17. Let's just take a look at those. Galatians 3.16. Now God made his promises to Abraham and to his descendant. The scripture does not use the plural descendants, meaning many people, but a singular descendant, meaning the person only, namely Christ. Okay, go Hebrews ahead. 6, 13 and 17. When God made his promise to Abraham, he made a vow to do what he had promised. Since there was no other greater than himself, he used his own name when he made his vow to those who were to receive what he promised, God wanted to make it very clear that he would never change his promise. His purposes. purposes. So he added his vow to the promise. Good news, Bible. Okay, two. The covenant obligation was obedience to God's will as expressed in the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 4.13. Deuteronomy 4.13. Moses said to the people, he told you what you must do to keep the covenant he made with you. You must obey the Ten Commandments which he wrote on two stone tablets. And that's from the Good News Bible. And three then, the means by which God's covenant obligation is ultimately fulfilled is through Christ and the plan of salvation. Isaiah 42, 1 and 6. 
The Lord says, here is my servant whom I strengthen, the one I have chosen with whom I am pleased. I have filled him with my spirit and he will bring justice to every nation. I, the Lord, that's Yahweh, have called you and given you power to see that justice is done on earth. Through you, and who is he talking to? Jesus. Jesus. Through you I will make a covenant, a promise with all peoples. Through you I will bring a light to the nations. Good News Bible. So we see that the three main elements of God's covenant with us include God's promises, our obedience, and three, the plan of salvation, to see how it's all going to work out. This is a life-changing commitment from God for us. In what way was it a life-changing commitment for God? Genesis 6, 17. I, I want you to answer the question before you read the oh. answer. <laughs> What, what way has God changed his existence because of sin? Have become human being. And Jesus Christ has that. become a permanently a human being. Yes, that's a tremendous sacrifice mm -hmm. for the Godhead to make on our behalf. And to bear that mark yep. on his hands and his side yep. forever, throughout eternity. That involves, of course, everything he did when he was here on this earth. Okay, Jim, what was God's covenant with Noah? Genesis 6, 17 and 18. I am going to send a flood on the earth to destroy every living being. Everything on the earth will die, but I will make a covenant with you. Go into the boat with your wife, your sons, and their wives. Good news, Bible. It is important to notice that everyone who responded to God's call got into the ark. The door was open. Others could have gotten in, however, they did not. Now, this is one of the evidences for God's foreknowledge. God could have said, make 10 boats, enough for all the people who want to get in. He didn't. He said, you're only going to need one boat. Because what? I know how many people are going to get in. I've been in the perfect replica of the boat by, made by Ken Ham and Ozzy in northern Kentucky. Yep. Man. It's massive, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, things could happen, you know, it, they could live. I mean, it's, uh, and all the animals and uh, whoever chose to be, it is massive. But if, remember, years ago, I was pointed out that Daniel, t t yeah, Daniel 12, verse 1, the, the NIV, which I many times don't care for, but it said, Michael stands up, your protector. Mm -hmm. And that was, basically, God provided protection for the antediluvian. Yep. Well, only, he knew it. only eight were going to climb on the boat. Yeah. He didn't need, and he spent 120 years warning them that something's coming down the pike. And it was enough time for all the animals to get in. Yeah, yeah. You could have gone in. We also need to remember that God is dealing not just with us on this earth. This is very, very important in our understanding of the Great Controversy but also he, had, he has the entire universe to deal with. How did they respond to God's plan to destroy the world? Colossians 1, 19 and 20. Is that yours, Carrie? No, I guess you did. You, no, it's mine, I guess. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. How many are being brought back to himself? Whole universe. The whole universe. God made peace through his son's blood, and in the footnote it says his son's blood or his son's sacrificial death on the cross and so brought back to himself all things both on earth and in heaven. So what does that mean? If you want to explain why Jesus had to die, you have to include the entire universe. What does the death of Jesus say, his life and his death, say to the rest of the universe? Well, for centuries, God looked with patience and forbearance upon the cruel treatment given to his ambassadors at his holy law, prostrate, despised, trampled underfoot. He swept away the inhabitants of the Noachian world with a flood. But when the earth was again peopled, Men drew away from God and renewed their hostility to him, manifesting bold defiance. Those whom God rescued from Egyptian bondage 
followed the footsteps of those who preceded them. Now, who? what time are we talking about now? Who's the leader at this time? Moses. Moses. Cause was followed by effect. The earth was being corrupted. A crisis had arrived where? In the government of God. All heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to the help of his elect. They looked down there and they saw how bad God's people were being treated and they said, just give us permission, God, we'll zap all their enemies. One word from him and the bolts of heaven would have fallen upon the earth, filling it with fire and flame. God had but to speak and there would have been thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction. Where do we read about thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction in the Bible? The final restoration? Well, the, the book of Revelation, May, several times. The heavenly intelligences were prepared for a fearful manifestation of Almighty God. So the angels around God's throne thought he would do what? He had drowned the world in flood once. What he thought was going to happen next? Do it again. The exercise of justice, as they saw it, was expected. The angels looked for God to punish the inhabitants of the earth. We're not talking about the evil angels. We're talking about the good angels standing around God's throne. They said, God, look at all that evil. What are you going to do? That's an example of why they still had lessons to learn, didn't it? Yep. The heavenly universe was amazed at God's patience and love to save fallen humanity. The Son of God took humanity upon himself. Revelation, I'm sorry, Ellen White Review and Herald, July 17, 1900, paragraph 4 to 7. So imagine, you're talking about the biggest war of all time, the, the great controversy, the cosmic conflict, and you're going to win it by sending what? His a, help, a, begotten a helpless son. baby boy. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if you think about that, it just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, look at this diary entry by Ellen White made in January 10, 1890 in Battle Creek, Michigan. And, and you'll recognize that that came shortly after what? 1898. 1888, the big general conference that just caused such a stir in the, in the Adventist church. Jim? For centuries, God bore with the inhabitants of the old world. But as last, at last, guilt reached its limit. He came out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth and by a flood cleanse the earth of its iniquity. Notwithstanding this terrible lesson, men had no sooner begun to multiply once more than rebellion and vice became widespread. Satan seemed to, take control, seemed to have taken control of the world. The time came that a change must be made or the image of God would be wholly obliterated from the hearts of the beings he had created. Okay, I want to stop there. That's a really important point that is missed by many people. A lot of people look at the flood and, wow, look at what kind, what is God doing? He's just wiping everybody out. I mean, what kind of a God is that? And of course, that's exactly what Satan wants them to think. But what is God saying? He is just about to lose his last contact on planet Earth. He can't let the whole thing, I mean, another generation or two, there wouldn't have been anybody listening to him anymore. So God had to preserve, excuse me, that one little family that was still listening to him. He had to preserve that one little family. That's why the flood was sent. Okay? All heaven watched the movements of God with intense interest. Would he once more manifest his wrath? Would he destroy the world by fire? The angels thought that the time had come to strike the blow of justice, when lo, to their wondering vision was unveiled the plan of salvation. Ellen White, 19, the Ellen White, 1988, excuse me, 1888 materials, page 569. Wow, that's amazing. So the, the angels in heaven said, God, what are you waiting for? Yeah, finish the job. After the flood was over, notice these words from God. Genesis 9, 8 to 17. God said to Noah and his sons, I am now making my covenant with you and with your descendants and with all living beings, all birds and all animals, everything that came out of the boat with you. With these words, 
I make my covenant with you. I promise that never again will all living beings be destroyed by a flood. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. As a sign of this everlasting covenant which I am making with you and with all the living beings, I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be a sign in my covenant with the world. Some of this can be absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Yes. I, I'm sure I'm sure some of you are aware that the Black Sea, uh, yeah, the Black Sea in, in, in the Middle East there has very little movement in it and and so that the the bottom level is clear in the bottom it's what two or three hundred feet down <clears throat> there's almost no oxygen at all in the water and things are preserved perfectly and they have found settlements down there under the water mm. and a lot of people are saying <clears throat> well this is where the flood took place well I, I'm pretty sure that some of those settlements that are buried underneath there probably were there before the flood, but it, it doesn't mean that that little Black Sea is the only place where the flood took place. Wasn't, uh, the, was it Ballard, or was, was exploring think, that sometime? Yeah, I think time so. Past? I think he still is. Could, uh, could be. Yeah, there. Um, interesting stuff down there. Whenever I cover the sky with clouds and with rainbow appears, I will remember my promise to you and to all the animals and the flood will never again destroy all living beings. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between men and all living beings on the earth. This is the sign of promise which I am making to all living beings. Good news Bible. Many years later we come to the story of Abram or Abraham, who was God's, what was God's plan for him? Reading from Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your relatives, and your father's home, and go to a land that I'm going to show you. I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse you those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations. So how is God going to bless all the nations? This was uh, just a side line, uh, side comment. This was or you are, and that was in Iraq. No. You, we went over this, so yeah. I just wanted to. Let me, yeah. let's just review that very quickly. Right. Uh, people for a long time wanted, where is this or? you are of Ur of the Chaldees. Mm -hmm. And way back in the early 1800s, there was, uh, and that was the days when archaeology was, was treasure hunters from Europe going over to the Middle East and just digging wherever they, think, they thought they could find something. And <clears throat> one of those early diggers was digging down in southern Iraq and he found a little piece of pottery, I think it was, that had the name Ur on it. And he said, this is the place. And so people have said that was the place from that day until this. But you'll find out that if you read the Bible carefully, it can't be the real Ur. Because, and Ellen White agrees. Ellen White has it correct. She says that Ur is on the other side of the Euphrates. But the Ur that he found was on, is on the western side of the Euphrates. Hmm. More than that, why would someone come from way down here in the south, go way up to, to um, Haran, and then back down to this? But if you look at the Ur of the Chaldees, which is in southeastern Turkey, there's a place that's still called Urfa. Urfa. And if you go to there, and then it's just a short distance over to Haran, where he lived for a number of years, and on there, on down to. So it's almost certain that the real Ur of the Chaldees is in southeastern Turkey. Uh, Turkey. Southeastern Turkey and not in... Uh, not in southern Iraq. Southern Iraq right. Yeah. Asia Minor, that would be Asia Minor, I mm -hmm. think. Right. Yeah. Okay, where are we here? Um, 
Galatians 3, how were all the nations involved? We're asking that question. Galatians 3, 6 to 9. Consider the experience of Abraham, as the scripture says, this is Paul's words, of course, quote, he believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. You should realize then that the real descendants of Abraham are the people who have faith. The scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scripture announced, that, announced the good news to Abraham, through you God will bless the whole human race. And who's he quoting there? You will bless the whole human race? That's the, I think Abraham. God's, that's the passage we just read, God's promise to Abraham, Abraham. wasn't it? So he's quoting that, exactly. Abraham believed and was blessed, so all who believe are blessed as he was. And then, dropping down a few more verses, Galatians 3, 20, if you belong to Christ, and if you belong to Christ, what are you called? You're his children. God's Christian. Heirs. 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 That, that's what a Christian should mean, right? right? If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. So if... One quick comment. Yes. And his faith was counted as righteousness. Mm -hmm. Okay. And even this faith comes from him. It's his mm -hmm. gift. So only thing we can do in the plan of salvation is accept. Nothing more. Even that faith comes from him. Yep. So our acceptance, that's the only thing that he would, he refuses to. What, yeah. He doesn't, he refuses to take away our freedom. Right. We are left with a choice. We, we can make the choice. We, he gives faith. If you want faith and you want to exercise that faith in the right way, right. God will make it possible. Amen. If you don't want to, if you choose to the other side, that God. God can weep, but uh, just as he wept over Satan, as we read last week, but uh, he will let you go. Well, notice very specifically in the covenant promise recorded in Genesis 12, that repeatedly God said, I will, I will, I will. So who is making the main promises there? God is making the promise every time. Yeah, it was, it was God making the promises. Now, we're gonna, in a moment, we're not gonna talk about this, but I'm just gonna, we will later talk about it, but I'm gonna mention this. When he came to the, to, um, the foot of Mount Sinai, we talk about the first covenant there at the foot of Mount Sinai. Who did the promising at the foot of Mount Sinai? Who did the promising who, who God did? again? No. The people said. He, no, they Whatever said, we said, will do it. God said, do it. I'm giving you this. And the people said three times. Yeah. Even, before they, even before they had got the word from God. Oh, whatever God says, we'll do it. We'll do it. Yeah. Okay, God, whatever you say, we'll do it. We'll do it, God. Everything you say, we'll do it. And then you finish the rest of the chapter. He says, well, and if anybody doesn't do it, kill them. Yeah. That was, that was their solution. Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, talk well, about, and, that's the way they were raised. And how, how, how what, a, a few days later. Forty days later. They're, they're dancing drunk right. and naked around right. a goal. Oh, right. man. Right. Right. Yes. And then was it just as we obeyed um, Moses and everything? <laughs> it was just to Joshua's time. That's Joshua's what it was. Time. Just as we obeyed everything, uh, Moses and everything, uh, and then but be of good courage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just as we obeyed, just as we always obeyed Moses, who will always obey you. Be courage. Be, have be strong. Have that, courage. That's, I think that's where then they, they, they waxed it well. Kill them if they don't. Yeah. If they don't do it. Yeah. They, they, not, they, don't, they don't do what you tell them to do. Yeah. Just kill them. They were not any different when Christ came. They yeah. were not any different when this they uh, stoned Stephen. Well, look at Genesis 15 verses 4 to 15. Uh, it's not on our handout, but I'll, this is re seems really strange to us. Then he heard the Lord speaking to him again. This is Abraham. Heard the Lord speaking to him again. This slave Eliezer will not inherit your property. Your own son will be your heir. The Lord took him outside and said, look at the sky and try to count the stars. You will have as many descendants as that. You know how many stars you can count with the naked eye <laughs> on a really clear night? About 4,000. Of course, out there, there are billions, aren't there? Abraham. Then, then he comes back in the tent and tells yeah. Sarah. 
So Sarah says, what did you have drink out there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, well, Abraham put his trust in the Lord. This is verse 6. And because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Then the Lord said to him, I am the Lord who led, I am Yahweh, who led you uh, out of the Ur in Babylonia to give you this land as your own. But God asked, I'm sorry, but Abraham asked, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that it will be mine? He answered, bring me a cow, a goat, and a ram, each of them three years old, and a dove and a pigeon. Abraham brought the animals to God, cut them in half, and placed the halves opposite each other in two rows. But he did not cut up the birds. Virtu vultures came down on the bodies, but Abraham drove them off. Now imagine this. When the sun was going down, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and fear and terror came over him. The Lord said to him, Your descendants will be as strangers in a foreign land. They will be slaves there and will be treated cruelly for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and when uh, they leave that foreign land, they will take great wealth with them. You yourself will live to a ripe old age, die in peace, and be buried. It will be four generations before your descendants come back here, because I will not drive out the Amorites until they become so wicked that they must be punished, and so forth. Um, so, what do you think of that? Take a bunch of animals, cut them in half, lay them across like this, and you, you, what happened? God passes through there in a, is a, a lamp or something else like that. What in the world was that all about? Well, this whole story may seem very strange to us, but records found from the area where Abraham was born and raised demonstrate that this was a standard way that people at that time made covenants. And the idea was, if you cut these animals and you break them in half, okay, if you break the covenant, look what's going to happen to you. And that, that was the idea. Any intimidation there? Of course not. What are you talking about? <laughs> okay. Genesis 17. Genesis 17, verses 1 to 14. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Almighty God. Obey me in all things and always do what is right. I will make my covenant with you and give you many descendants. Abram bowed down with his face touching the ground, and God said, I make this a covenant with you. I promise that you will be the ancestor of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham, because I am making you the ancestor of many nations, and I will give you many descendants, and some of them will be kings, and you will have so many descendants that they will become nations. I will keep my promise to you and to your descendants in future generations as an everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants. I will give to you and to your descendants this land in which you are now a foreigner. The whole land of Canaan will belong to your descendants forever. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I will be their God. I'm going to interrupt for a second. <clears throat> okay. When um, you ask the Jews today living in Israel, what is their claim to this land and what do they say? That's their, our land. that's their claim. God gave it to us. God gave it to us. Yeah. It's ours. Yeah. Go ahead. God said to Abraham, to Abraham, you also must agree to keep the covenant with me, both you and your descendants in future generations. You and your descendants must all agree to circumcise every male among you. From now on, you must circumcise every baby boy when he is eight days old, including the slaves born in your home and slaves bought from your foreigners. Now, I'm going to interrupt again for a moment. Why would God give that kind of a direction? I mean, if God wanted boys to be circumcised, why didn't he even create them like that in the beginning? Yeah. Well, there's a reason. Abraham and his descendants lived in a very wicked place where fertility cult customs were just rampant. And so by giving them this command to circumcise, 
when you get into one of these orgies that they were into, when everybody is completely naked, you can immediately tell who is a Jew and who isn't. Mm. So the, the, the Jewish, young Jewish men couldn't pretend like they weren't Jews. They were clearly marked. Yep. Okay. This was to show that there is a covenant between you and me. Each one must be circumcised, and this will be a physical sign to show that my covenant with you is everlasting. Any male who has not been circumcised will no longer be considered one of my people because he has not kept the covenant with me, the Good News Bible. And of course, we know that that became a huge issue in New Testament times, didn't it? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have to circumcise all the Gentiles who choose to become Christians? And Paul went around and around about that, didn't he? Was that I think Paul and... Was that situation ethics? Well... I think Paul, Paul and Peter he, he went after each other's throat yeah. once on this. Yeah. Do we have to follow every detail? Do you have to become a Jew, strict Jew, before you can become a Christian? That was the issue. And, you know, Paul was, Peter went up there and, in, into Antioch and he was joining up with the Gentiles and eating with them and so forth. And Paul came up and said, and then some people from Jerusalem came up and, he, and Peter said, well, no, I probably shouldn't be eating with you Gentiles. And Paul says, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> he really nailed him. <laughs> well, it's interesting to notice, God repeated this promise to Abraham twice before Sarah finally had a child. What was the response from Abraham and Sarah? Genesis 17, 17, Abraham bowed down with his face, touching the ground. But he began to laugh when he thought, can a man have a child when he's a hundred years old? Can Sarah have a child at 90? Really? <laughs> Genesis 18, 10 to 15. Okay, so Abraham laughed, okay? Go ahead and read Genesis 18. One of them said, nine months from now. This is, this, yeah, this is about some time later. Go ahead. I will come back and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. This is one of the three people visiting. Mm -hmm. right. Sarah was behind him at the door of the tent, listening. Abraham and Sarah no, were let's very Let's think old. about. Let's think about this for a moment. Think of the setting. Abraham, has, she has helped him prepare a meal for these men, but it was not for the custom in those days for women to eat at the same time together with the men. So Abraham is sitting out, and these strangers have come from who knows where. You know, they are wandering down this trail, and Abraham was talking to them and getting all the news. Well, what do you expect Sarah to be doing? Well, listening, of course. She, she, wants, she wants to know what the news is, too, so she's over there. She's not, she's not imposing herself on anybody. She's listening behind the curtain. That's what you would expect. And, and what happens? And Sarah had stopped having her monthly periods. Sarah had laughed to herself and said, Now this I'm old and worn out. Can I still enjoy sex? And besides, my husband is too old too. Okay, how many of them have laughed now at God? Abraham laughed at God, and now what's Sarah, Sarah doing? Did. Sarah's <laughs> laughing at God. Okay, go ahead. And <laughs> Lord asked Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, can I really have a child when I am so old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? As I said, nine months from now, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Wow. Because... What would you think? I mean, when they, when they first approached, apparently, you know, they had no idea that these people, these were more than just ordinary travelers. And now he starts making predictions like that and you're saying, hold on now. You know, we used to sing a song, Don't Be a Doubting Thomas. Yeah. Come on, don't be a doubting <laughs> Abraham. Okay. Come on. Okay. Yeah, Read Sarah, on. because Sarah was afraid she didn't deny it. I didn't laugh, she said. I love it. Yes, you did. Yes, you did, he replied. You laughed. Good news, so Bible. What, did, what did Sarah do? She not only, <laughs> Abraham and Sarah are both laughing at God's predictions, and then Sarah's lying about it. <laughs> and now they're called the, the parents of the faithful. <laughs> That's right. We have hope. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Should God have honored Abraham and Sarah as the parents of the faithful even after laughing at him and lying to him? Mm -hmm. 
There were about 25 years between the time God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees until he finally received the child born to Sarah. Abraham would come to believe and trust in God's guidance in almost all situations. He and Sarah had lied to Pharaoh in Egypt. Remember, he said, well, tell him you're my sister. Tell him you're, you're my sister, which is, was that true? Half truth. Or? Half truth, yeah. Right. And they had done the same to the king of Gerar. Gerar, I don't know how that's pronounced. But God remained faithful. God always goes the extra mile despite our foibles. Abraham continued to trust God. God also established a covenant with Moses and then with the people of Israel. Gary? Uh, reading from Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you are going to see what I will do to the king. I will force him to let my people go. In fact, I will force him to drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as Almighty God. But I did not make myself known to them by my holy name, the Lord. And that's, of course, the word Yahweh, the name Yahweh. So he's saying, before I, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Elohim, now I'm going to appear as a personal God, Yahweh. I also made my covenant with them, promising to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they had lived as foreigners. Now I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians had enslaved, and I have remembered my covenant. So tell the Israelites that I say to them, I am the Lord, I will rescue you and set you free from your slavery to the Egyptians. I will raise my mighty arm to bring terrible punishment upon upon them and I will save you. I will make you my own people and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God when I set you free from slavery in Egypt. Okay, I want to interrupt there for a second. Does that sound familiar? I will make you my own people and I, and I will be your God? Does that sound like anything anywhere else? Yes, that yes, is God's promise repeatedly. All, all along. Yes. Even all the, through even Scripture. the second uh, big uh, covenant. Yeah. We're going we're to see it. put it in your heart. And mm -hmm. you're going to be, my, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And down, John said that many times. I will come and eat with you and you with me and that kind of stuff. That's all this same kind of reciprocity. And I just need to make this comment. That there has been no difference in the, co the, the covenants that he has made. You're my children, I'm your God. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. uh, first uh, covenant, second covenant is the same thing. The way it was given, one was in the written in the uh, stones. So he says, next one I'm going to put in the heart. But it's yeah. the same same covenant he's yeah. making. Yeah, I will bring you to the land that I solemnly promised to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as your own possession. I am the Lord. That's from the Good News Bible. So notice again, he swears by what name? By his own name. By his own name. I mean, who else is he going to swear by, right? More than 400 years had passed since God's covenant had been given to Abraham. Was it finally going to be fulfilled? In what sense? This covenant contained many of the same principles mentioned to Noah and Abraham before Moses. Again, notice the three elements. One, God was establishing a special relationship with his people. See Genesis 17 and Exodus 19. God promised them very special status as a great nation. Genesis 12 and Exodus 19. But God cannot especially bless his children unless they remain obedient. Mm -hmm. Note the order here. The Lord first saves Israel, then gives them his law to keep. The same order is true under the gospel. Christ first saves us from sin, John 1.29, 1 Corinthians 15.3, Galatians 1.4, then lives out his law within us, Galatians 2.20, Romans 4.25, and so forth. That's from our SDA Bible commentary, but quoted in our Bible study guide. God had recognized the weakness of human beings, but he still made those prom precious covenant promises to them. Notice especially, Jim? Notice especially Romans 8, 1-3. There is no condemnation now for those 
who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, which brings us life in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do because human nature was weak, God did. He condemned sin in human nature by sending his own son, who came with a nature like sinful human nature, to do away with sin. Okay. So the question now we need to ask, remember in context of the whole great controversy now, how does the life and death of Jesus do away with sin? He came to do what? To do away with sin. How did he do that? Well, he's showed us how to live, but all, it, it comes to mind, uh, what is it, Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you yeah. that is with Christ Jesus. In other words, learn from him. You, it, remember, all through the Old Testament, God says, you don't listen. You don't listen. Mm -hmm. What's it? Well, uh, with the believer, uh, the lawgiver uh, has the chance, I mean, the believer has a choice to ask the lawgiver to live within his heart and the lawgiver keeps his own law mm -hmm. in the believers because the, you talk with any Christian, oh, the law has been nailed to the cross, therefore we don't need. And so why did Christ have to die? Yeah, that, that's I mean, a misreading of Colossians. Yeah, what they well, that's what text you referred to is Colossians two fourteen, yeah. and it's a misreading. They don't even understand uh, what the, what the Greek has to say, say yeah. there. Am, am I right, Ken? Yeah. Well, if you corner them, then, you know, yeah, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. But the Sabbath? No, that one. It's a yeah. memorial of creation. Now a memorial of redemption is the sun. But anyways. Okay, Charles? Yes, sir. First Peter? First Peter 224. Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross so that we might die to sin, haha, -ha, die to sin and live for righteousness. It is by his wounds that you have been healed. Now that's a, a, a verse that some of us struggle with. What does it mean Christ himself carried our sins in his body to the cross? Now I, I would, I wish that I should go back and look at the Greek very carefully. I wish that it said carried our sin not sins. I should look to see whether that's singular or plural. Because Christ died to deal, and we just read it from Romans 3, to deal with sin. It doesn't say Christ died to deal with sins. It says Christ died to deal with sin. So how does he deal with sin? Well, we, he showed us exactly what sin does. He showed us what sin does. And so we can, now we have the, 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 the covenant, I mean, the, and the demonstration is laid out before us. Um, God is waiting for you. Well, go ahead and finish. We'll, we'll move on here. I guess you read the whole chapter, the whole verse. I'm sorry. Is God still waiting for his covenant relationship to be established with his people today? What is it? Yes. You're right. It's, it's just, it's singular. Yeah. 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 Okay. Gary? Uh, reading from Exodus 6, verse 7. I will make you my own people, and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God when I set you free from slavery in Egypt. And that's okay. the Good News Bible. There's those words. You will know that I am the Lord your God. God yes. Yeah. I will make you my own people, and I will be your God. Sound familiar? Yeah. And also, he mentions again and again, slavery in Egypt, slavery in Egypt. I'm going to be your God. Now in the New Testament time, we're slavery from sins. Yeah. Slavery from Egypt in the Old Testament, New Testament, mm -hmm. slavery from sins. But finally, after Israel had been taken into Babylonian captivity, God spelled out in more detail what his covenant involved. He even called it a new covenant. Jeremiah 31. Beautiful text. I'm going to read this. Beautiful text. The Lord says the time is coming. He doesn't tell us exactly when. We have to figure that out. When I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. And of course, we've already read the verses that say, how many are descendants of Abraham? Oh. All those who have faith in God, right? It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. 
So what was the big difference between God's original covenant and the one he's making here now versus the one he made at the foot of Mount Sinai? What's the difference? One was written in the stone, the other one is written in the heart. Okay, the that's, that's, that, but that's, there's another, that's one. There's another very important difference. The covenant made at the foot of Sinai, who was doing the promising? Well, it's the men. <laughs> the people were doing right. the promising. All the other covenants, who was doing the promising? God. God was doing the promising. Now notice this again. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant, despite all their promises, we could add. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Again, they will be my God, I will be, I mean, I will be their God, they will be my people, same idea. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord. What's the secret here? Do you know the Lord? Because all will know me. From the least to the greatest, I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember the wrongs I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, a lot of people love to read that passage and they like to say, well, God is just going to wipe the, straight, the slate cl clear and there will be no record of sin. Well, hold on a minute. Are we going to study the plan of salvation for the rest of eternity? Yeah. Ellen White says that repeatedly in different ways. Can you study the plan of salvation without having any record of sin? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. You can't. No, it, it's impossible. You cannot do that. Yeah. No. And so, this is going to find its fruition only in second coming of Christ. Okay, but now what does God say? I will no longer remember their wrongs. What? That's a funny way to state things. Shouldn't you just say, I will forget their wrongs? I'm not going to bring it up. Okay, so God says, when, when we discuss all these things, you will all know about it. We'll all know about it, but we're not going to talk about it. Right. I no longer remember it. Doesn't mean there's nothing faulty with God's memory. He will always know all the details of our past and our future. But does that matter to him? If we choose to join his side, that's all he cares. Right. He, he's, he's not going to be saying, oh, you were the one that, oh, no, you, 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 none of that kind of stuff. It is interesting to notice that this is called a new covenant. Why is it called a new covenant? But God's promises are the same. How well are we doing on our part? God wants to be like a husband to us. In Revelation 19 and 20, we can read about God's final end time people being... A bride. The bride. Yeah. Twice it talks about a wedding and then it talks about the bride. And the bride is God's people. people. Note especially that in Jeremiah 31, 34, the secret will be that all will know me. All will know me. How does that relate to these words from Jesus' final recorded prayer before his crucifixion? Mm. And Jim, I have to let you read your favorite verse here. Thank you. <laughs> John 17, 3, and eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Okay, so he is said to, in, in, there in Jeremiah 31 and other places back here, you know, I will be your God, you will be my people, but there it says, you will know me. You won't have to teach, I won't have to tell Jim, Jim won't have to tell me or Charles and Carrie, we won't have to tell each other about God because we will all know Him. So what's the key to the, the new kingdom? Knowing Him. Knowing Him. I like to put John 17 forward with that because yeah. Jesus says, I have accomplished the work you gave me to do. Yeah. I have made known your character. Yeah. And uh, what a succinct way of yeah. mm -hmm. explaining things. Yeah. As we approach the end of this world's history, will we be expected to get to know Him well and be expected to obey God and to remain faithful to Him despite difficulties? Isn't that what it's all about? Yes. God calls for His law to be written in our hearts. And what does that mean? Let's look at that very specifically. Charles? The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he is required to do 
So now let me stop and, and, and interrupt for a second. Okay. okay, how many Christians are believe that they are keeping God's law because they're required to do so? <laughs> Most everyone. Maybe. Most of them. <laughs> so many. Yeah. Okay, read on. Will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. Okay, the person who does it just because he thinks he has to, does what? He does not obey. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about how God writes his law in, in people's own. hearts. That's what we're talking about. Okay? When the requirements of God are accounted, the burden, because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. Wow. Yes. Okay. Well, you know, from experience, uh, Sabbath, is it really truly a delight, especially when you're in school and you're studying biochemistry? Yeah. You say, Sabbath is here, I don't have to think about biochemistry. Yeah. But it's a delight. True mm -hmm. obedience is the outworking of a principle within. Okay, within, where is it? Where is the within part? In the heart. In the heart. Okay. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God, the essence of all right. Righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. Joseph knew that as mm -hmm. a young lad. Yep. He knew that. Um, this will lead us to do right because it is right. Because right doing is pleasing to God. Ellen White, Christ's object lesson. 97 and 98. Okay, and what happens if you don't, if you do it, I don't know, I, I, I will do it if it kills me, right? Kind of idea. Okay, Carrie? A sullen submission to the will of the Father will... That means I'll do it even if I don't want to. <laughs> the will of the Father will develop the character of a rebel. It does what? We've got to emphasize this. Will, it doesn't say might, maybe, perhaps will develop the character of rebel. All those people out there who just are struggling, I mean the Pharisees, they were, eh, we're gonna do this. We're gonna fast two days a week. We're gonna do, oh boy. And what are they doing? They're making them more and more, making themselves more and more rebels. Yeah. Go ahead. By such a one service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God, it is a mere mechanical performance. Okay. If he dared, such a one would disobey his rebellion. Hang on, I got out of... Disobey. Let me try that again. If he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complete. So he's saying if he dared, he would disobey. See? Yeah. So the person who's only doing it because he thinks he has to. Well, if I just... If I just had a chance, I would I would do that, right? Yeah. So is that is that law written in his heart? No. Yeah. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. That's the Ellen White sign of the times, eighteen ninety seven, yeah. paragraph okay. eleven. But um, I think some of that, what we parents do toward our kids, yeah, is, affects something like that at times. What's amazing is that when this, this quotation from Signs of the Times in 1897 is printed in one of the compilations later, they leave out that key, the sentence we put in, in, in bold there, they leave it out. Mm -hmm. If we are bound to God by yoke of love, what does that mean? The yoke that binds to service is the law of God, the great law of love revealed in Eden, proclaiming upon Sinai and in the great... Uh, proclaimed upon Sinai and in the new covenant written in the heart is that which binds a human worker to the will of God. If we were left to, to follow our own inclinations to go just where our will would lead us, we should fall into Satan's ranks and become possessors of his attributes. Therefore, God confines us to his will, which is high and noble and elevating. He desires that we should patiently and wisely take up the duties of service. The yoke of service Christ himself is born in humanity. He said, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Did he find it a hard time, a difficult time to obey God's law? Not at all. He delighted. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
John 6, 38. Mm. Love for God, zeal for his glory, and love for fallen humanity brought Jesus to the earth to suffer and to die. This was the controlling power of his life. This principle he bids us adopt. Zarb, ages 329 and 330. So what do you think? Were these covenants starting with Noah and continuing right down to us consistent? Yes. Absolutely. Or are God's covenant promises in our day different? No. As we've already suggested, God compares his covenant relationship with us to marriage. Is that a good analogy? Well, in a good marriage, despite problems and disagreements that may arise, love overcomes all. But often we allow those problems to fracture our love. It is clear all through the Old Testament and the New Testament that God goes way beyond virtually any limits that could be mentioned to reach out to us. We sometimes call this His grace, the reaching out on the part of God. What does grace mean? Scripture depicts three distinctive meanings of grace. Grace means loving acts of God toward undeserving sinners. Grace points to the wonderful character of God, and grace points to God giving us the strength to overcome. In the New Testament, the equivalent of the Hebrew term grace chen is the Greek idiom diatheke, which refers to a will or a gift in common with the covenant. The will, a legal document, is a free gift to a party that has no legal claim to it. Thus, a will also is a fitting model of God's grace. In these covenants that God made with Abraham, Moses, his church in the New Testament, and us, he has spoken to them and to us as a very personal God. He does not use his sovereign name, Elohim. He uses his personal name, Yahweh. Hmm. Can we, I guess we got time still to read that. Yahweh is the proper name of the God of Israel. Many recent scholars explain Yahweh as the one bringing into being, the life giver, the giver of existence, a creator, he who opens to pass who brings to pass, performer of his promises, the one who is, the absolute and unchangeable one, the existing ever living as self-consistent and unchangeable, the one ever coming into manifestation as the God of redemption. He will be it. He will approve himself, give evidence of being, assert his being, and so forth. Those are all the ways that that expression can be translated. So Yahweh is the name of God who revealed himself to Moses at Horeb and he's explained as I shall be the one who will be, he will be, he who will be it. I am he who I am. That is, I, it is not of no concern to yours. It is, I am, this is my name. Uh, and as much as I am, I am who, who I am, he, will, he who is essentially unnameable, inexplicable. And we're running out of time, but this is God saying I am. Let's pray. Our loving Father, how can we relate to someone who is the giver of all, the one who gives us life every day, every night, the one who is, who is existentially there, who does what is right, who challenges us to join him, the great I am, the Lamb, all those names that we can think of that apply to you. We are so thankful for what you have come to teach us. May we follow it more closely each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.